So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome today, today, to today's webinar, Engaging with Recruiters. I am Jessica Mueller, Associate Director of Alumni Engagement. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded. Uh, job searching has never been easy, but with the changes in the job market due to COVID, uh, this topic seems timely more than ever. Um, job seekers need to understand how to effectively market with recruiters to maximize their job search outcomes. Just a few reminders before I introduce our presenter, I kindly ask that everybody mute, uh, mute their mic to allow for best audio quality and also to use the chat function to ask questions. I'll be checking the chat for questions during it and we'll be asking Dan questions as we go, but we'll also dedicate some time at the end for Q&A. So I'm honored and grateful that we have the very talented, talented Dan Howard here with us today to share his professional insights on the hiring process from the talent acquisition perspective. Dan will discuss important information on how to about engaging with agency recruiters and corporate recruiters from resume review to interview preparation and more. Dan Howard is a Roosevelt alum, graduating from the Heller College of Business with a bachelor's in hospitality and tourism management in 2013. He also played for the Roosevelt men's college basketball team. I think he's repping his shirt today, so go Lakers. Upon graduation, Dan worked for several, in, for several years for a market research firm in a leadership and operational role before transitioning to a talent agency where he worked with Fortune 500 clients Visa, Exxon, and United Airlines to fill contract-based positions. After spending time working in an agency setting, he joined Motorola Solutions, where he now works with the talent acquisition team, filling internal needs for mission-critical communications. Dan, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We are very excited to have you, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it's a really weird time with COVID. It's kind of chill. Um, so I, I'm, I want to start with this. Unfortunately, through all this, there is no like secret sauce. Uh, there is no special way to write a resume to, to get past everything. Every company is different. Every recruiter is different. Every hiring manager is different. So my goal is just to try to give everybody some best practices uh, for that way, for all of you moving forward. Um, so I guess I'll start with the agency side. Um, there's always a lot of questions around agencies, agency recruiters, what do they do, is it worth it working with them and all that. Uh, first, first things first, they have the same goal as, as any internal or corporate recruiter or, or talent acquisition specialist, and that is to get a butt in the seat. Um, they form great relationships with hiring managers, um, and contract work is a great way to start with a, a larger company. Um, the best way for me to, to explain that is typically on the uh, on the corporate side, we'll get thousands of applicants for a position um, and we'll sometimes reach out to agencies and we'll engage them to help us either sort through or of all those applicants, we can't find someone that is really a good fit. Um, when I was working in agency, I formed such good relationships with some hiring managers that I was literally the hiring process. And if I pushed a candidate forward, they would hire them. Um, does anybody have any questions around contract recruiting or want to know more about that topic before we dive into it or um, how pay works with contract recruiting or, or anything like that? Awesome. So when you are engaging with the con when you're when you start the process with an agency it's a little bit different because you're going to be an employee of that agency working at another company so anybody that i placed when i was an agency recruiter was technically an employee of populous group which is where i used to work working at you know visa exxon etc um at any point even if they even if they were in a, a short-term contract, I can't tell, I, I can think of two right off the top of my head that were supposed to be, you know, three-month contracts or six-month contracts. Um, those can still turn into full-time positions. Um, so right away, don't worry too much if you're working with a, a, a recruiting agency and they're, they're telling you it's short-term and you only want long-term. Sometimes those short-term contracts, if you go in there and you impress everyone, can turn into a long-term opportunity. But um, you can negotiate, you negotiate your pay, your benefits, all of that through the contracting agency. So 
So there's a little bit more flexibility there. The rule of thumb is typically if you're going through a contract, you're going to be paid a highly hourly wage because you, normally the benefits aren't going to be as good. And like I said before, it, it potentially could be short term. So depending on how short it is, you should be looking for anywhere from a 10 to 15 to 20% increase for what the wage would would normally be for a position for somebody in that position. Um, and does anybody have questions around that? Cool. Um, so what agencies are good to work with? Really, really easy way to vet that out. When you're working with an agency, they should advertise who their clients are and they should be working in specific verticals. So if you're engaging with an agency, you, you wanna make sure that they're an agency that's geared towards what you're doing. A really good example of this is tech systems. I know there's tech systems offices all over the United States. They work specifically with certain, uh, with certain to have somebody work with just now engineers, not developers, so that way they can really hone in on the roles that would be right for you. Now that doesn't mean that smaller would, it's just really tough um, and you could get lost in the mix really easily because you know, if you're working with a recruiter that's working with business analysts, project managers, um, everything under the sun, you know, the, it's just going to be too much and it's very, very easy for them to lose somebody in the mix. Um, so when you're negotiating, uh, I apologize, we just got a question. Um, so not everybody is, so I got a great question here about negotiating salaries and, and somebody had a really negative experience. So uh, on the agency side, there's really, just two primary ways that a markup for their services to, to the end client. So they would say, hey, we're going to place somebody at your company and we're going to charge you a, a X percentage uh, of whatever their base is for, for, you to, for us to place them with you, or they're given a bill rate. Now, if they're given a bill rate, that means that they have to operate inside the confines of that bill rate. Um, what you, when they have a bill rate, they, tip, they typically have to find a way to make everything fit, so it might not be as negotiable. Um, if they're do, operating on a markup, their interests are aligned with yours. Um, so they might have a, that company is looking to pay, and they know based on that experience and working with them how to what realistically they can get. you in for. Now, agency recruiters are normally very, very tough to negotiate was because at the end of the day, they are working. That's really how they get paid is placing people in. And if it's a bill rate, you know, getting a percentage of that bill rate so that way they can operate. Um, it makes it a little bit tougher. But at the end of the day, their goal, like I said, is to get somebody to sit down in a chair and, and do the job. Um, <sighs> So that, that's kind of that's kind of the gist of agency, you know. Like I said, they're a good way to start, um, and this is going to kind of segue into going into the corporate side and engaging with corporate recruiters. Uh, if a corporate recruiter reaches out to you, you're having a conversation with them. Check their LinkedIn. Um, see how long they've been there. Get an understanding of how well they know the business, because some. Sometimes, uh, just like in everything else, there are bad recruiters. Um, there are recruiters who just really don't know the business as well as they should. Um, they just don't know what's going on, and they don't know what the rates are. They don't know what the rates should be, and they could put out an insulting offer. They could not follow up. So don't be afraid to, to check, out a LinkedIn, uh, check out on LinkedIn and see the recruiter's experience and, and, you know, seeing your recruiter inside that own network. Um, stuff like that isn't frowned upon. At the end of the day, you're going to have to be searching for your job. Um, 
Now, the reason I'm using that to segue into uh, the corporate side, when I started at Motorola, I, it was a learning experience. There are There is no perfect way to transition from company to company, and there is no perfect way for me to learn everything right away. Um, so when I started at Motorola, there was a steep learning curve, especially with uh, very, very specific things that Motorola looks for in their employees. So I'll be the first to admit, when I first started, I probably wasn't the best one to reach out to for roles because I just didn't know where to go with certain things. Um, that being said, once somebody's there for, for five, six months a year, they normally have a really good understand. They normally have a better understanding and, and a strong enough understanding and good enough business ties to be able to direct you properly to what you're looking for. Um, now on the corporate side, I, I can start diving into some more stuff. Um, Jessica, do you want me to start with resumes or do you want me to start with jobs? Because both those kind of tie in nicely to one another. Whichever you'd like. Whichever you'd like. Okay, so let, let's start with everybody's uh, resumes. Here's a question. Um, um, is it okay to connect on LinkedIn uh, during the interview process with recruiters? Yeah, absolutely. Um, recruiters are, 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 are a resource. I mean, that, that's our goal at the end of the day is to be a resource for people. Um, we want to make sure that we can help facilitate um, everything. I mean, that's really kind of our job is to help push things along and push things forward and make sure that everything's going as smoothly as possible. Um, when you connect with a recruiter, just don't send them a, a, a connection and never speak to them again. Be very deliberate, intentional, and clear about your messaging. Um, I can't tell you how many times I get messages or, or LinkedIn requests where it's extremely generic and it's all the things I see people complain about recruiters for. Um, it, you know, it, it's like, hey, I, I, I see that you work at Motorola. Here's my resume. Let me know if you have any openings for me. Um, uh, unfortunately, we have so many openings at times that I, I, there's no way. I can look a really good message it would be something along the lines of, hey, I've applied for this position and based on the, the job description and my resume, these are a couple of highlights that I, of the experience I have. This is if you have time to connect for a quick conversation. Um, help, help them help you by providing some of that information and letting them know. If you're already in the process, just, you know, con confirm things with them, uh, let them know how conversations went. Uh, I, I mean, recruiters will always, always, always be willing to, well, most recruiters should be willing to, to step out and help you and engage with you and make sure that you're having a good candidate experience and make sure that they're there to help you along the way. Um, circling back to uh, the, the resume side, a lot of resumes get lost in the mix. Um, I was on one of these presentations where they were talking about the importance of uh, uh, applicants. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that was a LinkedIn webinar that they had that Roosevelt hosted, and, and that's great advice. When you see a, a brand new posting, you know, don't be be one of the first people to apply. It goes a long way because, like I said, it's very easy to get lost in the mix when there's a thousand plus applicants. Um, on top of that, in your resume. Be sure to, to be organized and list what you've done. Um, and when I say list what you've done, I mean do it in an effective way. Uh, list the technologies that you've worked with. List um, things you've, uh, so if you're in sales, list you know, what your CRM was. List how it was used. If, you were in, if you're in a technical environment, list the technical environment you, had, you, you were in and list how you supported your team. Don't just put generic things that you did. Be really clear because what a lot of these ATS applicant tracking systems do is they'll only show us some highlights. And when there's too many applicants and we can't go through every resume, it's like I said, it's very, very easy to get lost in the mix. Um, I apologize, I just lost my thought there. Uh, so when you're going through your resume, include things like the technologies you've used, include things like how you've supported your project, um, make sure you list the dates of when you were with a company, um, and make sure you list relevant, relevant work experience. 
Um, don't have just one generic resume and think that that's going to get things done, especially with COVID going on, especially with the number of unemployed. Uh, it, it, it's just not feasible right now. Uh, really try to tailor your resume for those specific positions that you're going for. Because um, the, the last thing you want to do is, is take the time to apply to a position and that position just get lost in the you just get lost in the wind. Um, so, so when you're reading a job description, job descriptions are meant to, um, so job descriptions are meant to are or are not a good fit. There are always a bunch of different sections. Um, the basic qualifications, the best way to think about those, that is if the basic qualifications more times than not are if there's an internal employee we have to be able to explain why we move them, even if they're not the best fit for the role. That's pretty standard across all companies. So don't get too caught up, oh, well, this position says I just need two years of experience and I need to have been able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Don't read too much into basic qualifications. Read more into the desired skill sets. Make sure your resume aligns with desired skill sets. Those desired skill sets are normally exactly what they're looking for as far as tools used, noteworthy experience, things like that. Um, as far as it comes to formatting your resume, please don't put graphs on it. Please don't put something like, I'm 8 out of 10 in this, this area. Because the first question that we, we will always ask is, what ranked you 8 out of 10? How are you, you know... 75% proficient in something. It, there, it's just not a good, it, it, it's normally not a good way to communicate that stuff. I would rather read how you supported a project than have to pull up some weird chart and look at the chart and try to understand what that stuff means. Um, some people still put photos, like, like selfies on their resume or professional, port, uh, professional snapshots. I'm not a huge fan of those either, but you know, I understand that some people like some, there's still some old school people who really like them. So, you know, I, either way on that, as far as the one page resume goes, uh, if, if you have five years of experience or less, a one page resume is fine. Unless you're in a very technical field and you have a ton of tools that you want to list. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say now that we can start getting away from one page resumes and you can start listing your full skills, your certifications, the tool, like I said, I can't stress enough, the tools you've used, how you use them, and how you support the projects you work on. Um, so template resumes aren't discouraged, but, you know, change the stock language. Don't, oh, don't, don't just send it, like I said, take your time on them. It, really, the best way to think of a resume is, is a movie preview. I know it sounds really silly and simple, but if there's a bad movie preview and it looks really generic, are you going to watch the movie? Um, you want your resume to strike enough interest for people to, to read it and say, hey, you know what? This person might be a good fit or this person's at least a 75% match. This could be a good conversation. They could ramp up quickly. Um, so templates aren't discouraged, but don't just go with something that's like, you know, stock wording, stock formatting. It's okay to be an individual in that sense. Um, yeah, so the big thing is those job descriptions and resumes, make sure they tie together. And don't get caught up in basic qualifications. Get caught up in desired skills. Um, interview prep. So when you're getting ready for an interview, research the company know about the company. I cannot tell you how many times I've had a conversation, and, and let me preface that with, own what you don't know. So if you don't know something, just own it. Say you don't know. I didn't have time to do a, enough research. There's nothing more that makes my screen, skin crawl more than when I'm having a conversation with someone and I say, what do you know about Motorola Solutions? How familiar are you with us? And they say, oh, you know, I had a Razor cell phone. For anybody who doesn't know, Motorola Solutions, we sold that side of the business off in 2011 to Google, who sold to Lenovo. So Motorola Mobility, a Lenovo company, is a totally separate entity from Motorola Solutions. We're a, a Mission Critical's 
public safety company. Um, so, so make sure that you do your research on companies. And if you don't know, you don't know. That's absolutely fine. No one's ever going to fault somebody for saying for owning things and saying, you know what, I, I'm just not sure. Could you please let me? Could you please tell me? Um, Dan, there's there, there's two questions here. Yeah. Um, will my resume be get skipped if I don't have quantifiable achievements to list? And what about um, a list? Like if you only have had temporary jobs thus far, do you list those out? If it's within the same company, say this person's worked at the same university for two and a half years with um, various temporary jobs. Okay, both really good questions. So let me start with the quantifiable one. Um, so if you don't have quantifiable achievements, that's not the end of the world. Um, really dive into how you supported projects and what you were working on or with. Um, li list your quantifiable skills. List things that you've done to help support. Uh, you know, if, if you weren't a valedictorian or you weren't the one who, uh, I, I can't think of another good example, but if you weren't the one who uh, made the big breakthrough as far as uh, some sort of communication project, that's not the end of the world. That won't stop you from getting another job if you were the one who's do, giving a ton of support and doing a lot of the legwork on other portions. Stress how you helped support and build that team so that way somebody else could get the ball across the goal line. No one's ever going to say no to a team player. Um, as far as the temporary jobs, you know, that's always tough. Make sure you list the dates. Make sure you, you, th there's two schools of thought. You can list the, com the, the, the agency that you were working with when you had your temporary job and the company that you were working at. Um, but just make sure it's organized. You know, employment gaps are not looked at the same way as they were a few years ago. It's becoming more universally understood that things happen in life. Things go wrong. Um, The agency was an in-house agency at the university, so you could so you could just list uh, if it was Roosevelt, you and Robert Morris, or or whoever the university was. You could just list that you were an employee of the university, working on you know a, a temporary a, a temporary position, temporary, and then whatever the title was, the dates, and then what your uh, jobs were during it. D uh, does that make sense? Cool. So. And Dan, how do you, um, how do you um, handle salary questions, initial phone screen? Salary questions and initial phone screens, those are always fun. Um, you know, you don't have to, so obviously nobody should be asking what you, what you were paid in your previous position. That's just such an out of line question. If somebody asks that to you, you know, you got to start questioning the, the, the morale, maybe morality is not the right word, but it's just a question you don't have to answer. Um, and I know if I was looking for a position, and somebody asked me that, I wouldn't answer it. Um, obviously, nobody wants to work all day so that way they can come home and eat hot dogs and ramen. So you got to know at least what you, what your take home needs to be. Um, I normally try to, and personally, and this is coming from me, and even now when I ask it, I ask it this way ballpark so you know i'm looking for a range of um and, and i'm normally very transparent and candid you know hey i understand you know it's a, it's an awkward question i just want to make sure that i don't burn any your time getting right now as a base salary or base compensation package and i mean it's an easy question for you guys that for for anybody to ask as well hey I respect your time. I want you to respect my time. What what's the base? What does the base compensation look like for this position? Um, and you know, if if you know what your value is, and you and you've done the research, and you know that you're working in a position that should be paying seventy to eighty k or a hundred to one hundred and ten k, just tell them, hey, you know what? For for a full time position right now in this role, I'm I'm looking for a range of a uh, 100 to 115 K and and that's going to depend on what some of the benefits and and other and, and other perks look like be transparent that that's the best advice around that um, and if they come back and they counter with a low ball don't be afraid to walk away 
just tell them, hey, you know what, right now that doesn't work for me. It, you know, maybe if I'm in a dire situation, it might work later on. But right now, uh, unfortunately, this just this just isn't right. Um, don't don't be afraid of transparency. Don't be afraid of candor. Uh, there's a great uh, on a side note, and I'm not getting paid for it. Uh, there's a great book out there called How to Say Anything to Anybody. Uh, how to say anything to anybody or anyone. I can't remember, but great, great read. And, uh, you know, it really helped me in the workplace and it really helped me with, with, with those kind of conversations that don't feel comfortable. Um, just embrace the candor. Any, does anybody else have any other questions around that? Cool. So we were talking before that we were talking around uh, uh, knowing the company. So know the mission statement, you know, know what the company does, ha have a broad idea. If you don't know, just own that you don't know. But once you actually get into the interview phases, there's something called the star method. I'm sure that most of some of you are at least familiar with it. Situation, task, action, result. When you look at those desired skills, a good way to prepare is to have situation, tasks, actions, and results built around those desired skill sets. Um, you know, a, a time that you used a, a situation X and, you know, what, you had to do it in order to implement product Y. This is, and the action that I took to, to do this was, you know, blank and the end result was that we were able to to make a million dollars make sure that you're organizing those answers and prepare those answers because a lot of those questions that you're going to get are going to be built around that and that'll be after the initial phone screening um so that's after talking to somebody like myself or or another recruiter who might not be a, a subject matter expert in that area um make sure that when you're going into those conversations with hiring managers or, or other team members that you have some really good star method answers built around desired skill sets. Any questions around the star method or, 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 or that? Um, another really good way to go into the, so, so there's always two sides to every interview, I apologize. There's those, Technical, like there's a technical portion, even for non-technical roles, that they, they, they want to know that you know how to do everything from operating a, a POS system to uh, how to use a uh, how to use stock scanning to whatever it is. Nowadays, there's always some type of technical component, so make sure you're ready to go with those. But when it comes time to ask answering those soft questions, those soft skill questions, a really good way to prepare for those is by understanding the mission statement of the company. A good example of this is Facebook. Facebook wants to be able to put everybody in touch with everyone and, and increase their, their increase people's voice. So if I was in, in an interview with a Facebook, I would be answering my questions around the soft skill questions or based around their mission. Statement. So even though I'm users to what their mission is. Um, it's a very, very good way to handle some of those soft skill questions. So it's always tough to tell if a position is hourly, uh, like a minimum wage hourly versus salaried position, uh, especially if they don't list it. Um, there are so many different companies out there that it's always, it's always a challenge. Um, and I apologize for, for changing the subject. I just saw this question come in. Uh, you know, if you apply, just nip it in the bud right away and just have that conversation with them. You know, just, just say, hey, you know what, I'm really, really interested in this position. But, you know, is this, is, is this an, a minimum wage or is this an hourly that, that, that's low paying or is this a, a, an actual salary that I can support myself on? Um, I, I want to say that most companies, you know, if, if it's two to two years, three years, you know, no experience necessary, those should be positions that are low paying. There are some companies out there that try to, you know, dress things up and, and they, they have all this fancy lettering and, and stuff. And, you know, it's a job that pays barely $15 an hour. 
Um, you, you know, there, there's always going to be companies out there that are going to try to lie, cheat, and steal their way to the top. I, I feel bad for saying that. So, like I said, there, like I said at the beginning, there's no magic formula to to tell that. But anytime you're dealing with a larger or more reputable company, really try to look at those years of experience and what they're what they have in the base basic qualification section. Um, because that's normally pretty telling. If it's zero years of experience or no no experience necessary, no degree required, um, those will probably be positions that are going to pay less, as opposed to positions that require a bachelor's plus two or three years, or or require some types of certification. Those should pay. Those should pay a, a livable wage. Um, but like I said, I can't stress enough. There's always going to be some company out there that's trying to apply and, and they're going to make it sound like they turn water into wine. And then you're going to find out that it pays, you know, $7 an hour plus tips. If anybody even tips in that situation. Um, any other questions around, around that portion? Cool. Uh, so, so we kind of we've kind of touched on that soft skills and technical skills. Uh, the other thing I want to touch on with interview prep is making sure you're organized. Have a grasp on what you've done, how you've completed it, and even if you don't have true metrics or um, you know, they, they call it, some people call them KPIs that you had to hit, like, you know, individual performance statistics. Be sure that you can at least speak to how you've increased something, how you've improved something, and put tangible numbers into it. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many salespeople I've talked to where they tell me that they don't have, you know, any type of metric or quota that they have to hit. And then I'll ask them a, a really simple follow up to that of, well, how much did you grow the business? How, what, what was your net new revenue last year versus this year? And they can't answer the question. Same thing goes for a technical, uh, for a technical side where they didn't have a number of tickets, a, a, a true measurement on how much input that they had to have in a project, but they couldn't explain how they supported the project or what their day to day looked like because they just, I don't know if they weren't ready for the question or what. Make sure that you can quantifiably explain what you did day to day and how you impacted the business by doing those things. Um, and, and to me, that's just being organized and prepared. Make sure that you understand, that you have an understanding. It's really just making sure that you have an understanding of what your day to day is and how you can maximize your, your output. Um, and if you don't have the, if you're not organized and you can't answer those kind of questions, you're, you're really going to put yourself behind the eight ball. So online interviews do the exact opposite of what I'm doing now. I have the room set up the exact opposite of the way I have it set up. And I apologize for this. Um, we're, we just moved. So I'm still in the process of unpacking things. Um, you should have the light. It, it starts with having the light on the other side of the laptop, um, so that way you don't have a, like a bright thing coming from the your from behind you. Um, you want your laptop to be elevated so that way it's eye level. Um, dress professionally. I apologize. I was going to wear a uh, a button down for this, but I I saw my Roosevelt basketball shirt and I thought it was a great time to break it out. Um, make sure that your sound and that your video is working properly. This is gonna sound crazy, but don't have cheat notes. Don't have things that are off to the side that can distract you. There's nothing worse than doing an online interview and having the person stare like this and they're clearly reading something the entire time. Um, and, and be transparent and candid. You know, I, I have a dog. He's completely knocked out because we went for a run this morning, but normally I start my conversations by apologizing that I have a dog. Because at some point he could just start barking and really mess up a conversation. If you if you're in a situation where you have kids and you couldn't you can't get them to childcare, just let them know up front. Hey, you know what? I I I have my kids with me today. 
we couldn't get them child care, they might make some noise in the background. I apologize ahead of time. Um, just like I said, own those things. There was a really interesting study that was put out uh, around diversity and that more diverse candidates may have problems with online interviews for the simple reason they might not have the, the network support or they might not have a, a space to, to effectively do an interview. Um, you know, that's tough. It, it's a really, really tough situation. I say if you're in that kind of situation, talk to, talk to the family, let them know that you're going to be doing an interview. Um, well, in worst case scenario, you know, tack, tack a, a, a blanket behind you so that way you can have a, uh, a backdrop. And uh, if anybody wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, I actually have a really good video and a cheat sheet for how to properly a, a prep for an, an online interview uh, that will give advice around uh, setting up your sound, cheap backdrop, and, and, and things of that nature to, to help. Um, I'll make sure that I actually you know what I can do that right now. Um, Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, and like I said, you can just uh, shoot me a message asking for that, and uh, I'll send it over to you. Uh, it has a, a quick little video. So, probably one of the most successful uh, people that I've I've helped coach is an employee that's at Visa. Um, she had just relocated from Arizona to uh, the Seattle area. Um, we got her in for an AEM role. Uh, we did. Ev I helped her with everything from salary negotiation all the way through to uh, as far as like what to present during the interview. Um, that was an awesome situation. She was targeting. I think it was like 30 or 34 dollars an hour we ended up getting her like 66 dollars an hour um and that once again that was just me understanding the market and having a relationship with the manager i knew that what she was targeting um but uh you know we really hammered in on those desired skill sets we mock interviews with one another where we would ask, i would ask different questions around the desired skill sets and when I would ask those questions around the desired skill sets, we were making sure that she had very specific star method answers that didn't ramble or go into any rabbit holes or any other topics. They really stayed on point and organized to those things. Um, we talked, we had, uh, we made sure that all of her actions were quantifiable and this is how I improved this. This is, this is the money. This is the amount of money we saved by switching this format and doing this thing. Um, and we made sure that her soft her soft skill answers were all tied into v, the visa's mission statements. Uh, she was actually only going for a three month contract. Uh, the contract got extended all the way out for I believe twelve months. Then uh, she went and worked for Nintendo for two months, and then Visa reached out to me and let me know that they wanted to extend her a full time offer. Uh, they reached out to me directly because they couldn't get a hold of her, and I let her know. And she's actually now a full time employee at Visa. So that that was a huge that was a huge one. And circling back, that's actually one of the perks of working if you work with an agency. Um, agent agency recruiters, I mean, they they will do a very 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 good job of helping you prep for interviews. Most agency recruiters will ask you if you want to do an interview prep. I always encourage you to to say yes. Um, they normally have great and detailed notes around hiring managers, what they're looking for. They normally know some of the questions that are going to be asked during the interview. So you can really dig in and, and have success. Um, agent, agency recruiters are awesome for that. Uh, I, I learned all that. I learned all of my agents, uh, all of my interview prep from some senior recruiters that, that put me under their wing when I first got to Populous. It, it, they're really, really good. Um, you might not get that from corporate recruiters. Corporate recruiters are going to have more of the attitude of, hey, you need to come ready for this. This is, you know, you're an adult. You have to perform. And if you don't perform, you know, there's, there's somebody else that will. Uh, so definitely take advantage of agencies in that sense.
So we just got um, two questions that came in. Give me one second. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take these in order. So transferring skill sets is always tough, especially right now. I hate to be the Debbie Downer. Um, transfer, transferable skill sets are tough right now because there are so many people who are unemployed that the idea of a company having to invest in the ramp up doesn't seem as, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not as appealing as if I can just hire somebody who already has that skill. It, there are like, transferable communication skills that are transferable um, things that you that everybody's done. So I would suggest highlighting that. But whatever field of work you're moving towards, you're going to have to step out on your own and, and, and get certifications or do a boot camp or or whatever it is that you need in order to make that transition. Uh, it's going to be really really tough right now. Um, it, with the current climate, just to make a cold transfer and, and, and think that a company is going to just throw money to invest to ramp someone up. Uh, I, like I said, I, I hate being the, the one who's to say that because I made a, I'm, you know, I, I think that people should be able to, to transfer and, and, and try new things and, and grow, but it's a very, very tough time to do that right now. Uh, unless you're investing in yourself and getting certifications and, and really trying to, to grow outside uh, of that. Um, you know, like I said, just stress the, the base, the, the base things that you, you're in your current role. So the communication aspects, um, the day-to-day -day aspects, showing that you're organized, showing that you helped grow something. But, um, you know, if you're looking to, to make a, a big change, you're going to have to step out and, and really find ways to, to, I can't stress enough, get certified um, and, and show that you have the initiative to go out and do these things. Um, how early can, uh, so applying early is never a bad thing, but, but don't be applying. applying for positions six months out. So typically, if a, if a company's posting a need, the need is now. You can search for their, 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 their pipeline positions, um, and that's so that way they have people who are ready to go once the jobs become available. So, you know, if you're looking to apply super early to a role, look for those kind of positions. I know that at Motorola, we call them evergreen recs. So you can, it, it, and they're clearly marked that there is no need to hire right now, that it, this is a position that will be open in the future and that we're just building out, a, uh, we're building out uh, candidates for it for when it's open. So if you're, if that's a good, that's a good way to, to search and find roles. Otherwise, um, you know, wait till you're two to three months out maybe, and, and start the application process then. Don't. And just be transparent with them. Like I said, uh, you, I'm pretty sure I've said that word about a hundred times already. But let them know, hey, this is my graduation date. I can start on this date. Um, I, I know every situation is different, but if you're planning to go on a on a six month uh, excursion after you after you finish up school, then you know you might want to wait even longer before you start applying. Um, I think a good rule of thumb is probably two to three months out from graduation is when you really want to start hitting. Uh, hitting up positions and, and, and trying to find an opening, uh, but don't, but not a year out unless it's an evergreen or, or, or a position where they're clearly indicating that they're pipelining. Um, so yeah, you can, uh, so you can find agencies. Uh, agencies will proactively reach out to people, but um, Aerotech, Tech Systems are two really, uh, Robert Yeah, those are really good, well-known. Um, you can actively apply to those. You can reach out to recruiters in those networks on LinkedIn and just let them know that that you're in position Y and you, you'd like to have a conversation with somebody there that that can help you, uh, you know, get into. So it, both agencies can find you, but you can also reach out proactively to an agency. 
Um, you know, I know I just named three, but there are a, a lot of different agencies out there. And like I said, just research the agencies and make sure that, you know, your skills align to what they're doing. If you're a non-technical person, it doesn't make sense <clears throat> for you to have a conversations with tech systems because they only work on technical positions. Same thing goes vice versa. You know, if you're looking for a position where you're going to, uh, where, where you're going to be doing something extremely technical and you don't want anything to, I, I, you guys get what I'm saying. I apologize. I lost my train of thought there, but uh, just make sure you're researching those companies and that your skills align for what they work on. So the best way to follow up with the phone screen, it, it's going to sound really generic, it, is a thank you letter or, or maybe not even a thank you letter. Just that you can, it, it's becoming normal enough now where you can just shoot a message over on LinkedIn or, or whatever, or an email and just say, hey, uh, I just wanted to take a second to, to thank you um, for, for your time. Uh, I'm really interested in the position. Is there any feedback that I can get on the role? You know, a good way to, to push recruiters to get more is to ask for feedback, constantly ask for feedback and follow up. Um, you want to just, you know, let them, let them know that you want to know why you didn't get something and that you, You have thick enough skin that you can handle cultural fit. If my, my technical skills didn't align, awesome. What technical skills didn't align so that way I know what I would just ask for feedback. Just be ready for, for honest feedback. Um, you know, some places might send out generic responses or those no replies. Um, like I said, every company is a little bit different. I know that with the people I work with, I always try to get them as I always try to get them feedback and I always try to let them know exactly what's going on. You know, if there was an internal candidate that was just better, it, you know, your, your skills are awesome. I encourage you very strongly to apply again to another role that we have open. Right now, we just went with an internal, uh, an internal candidate that we felt would have a faster ramp up. Um, but uh, them, let them know that you're still interested and just ask for feedback. Just say, hey, I, I just want to know if you have any feedback for me as far as this position goes or any other positions that you guys may have open. Um, there are some, there are some misnomers out there around applying for multiple positions at the same company. Some people say it's frowned upon. Some people say it's not frowned upon. Um, truth is it depends. If you apply for positions that are very, very similar at the same company, there is nothing wrong with that. It shows that you're interested in the company. Cool, I've applied to, to five, six, 10 of the same style of positions. I really wanna get in with this company. Nothing wrong with that. If you apply 100 plus times to the same company and none of the roles align, none of them are the same, that's a good way to get red flagged. Um, and I'll be, it happens way more than people realize that we haven't, I mean, there are like, it's almost an ongoing joke. Some people will apply for any position that we have open. Um, and we'll click on, we'll click on it and we'll see that they've applied to a thousand plus positions in the past couple of months and none of them align. It's just not a good look because it doesn't look like you're focused or organized on your career development. It looks like you're just trying to blast to open. positions so make sure that it looks make sure that you're being organized and that it's aligned and that it's this person wants to get into this skill set um don't look unorganized looking unorganized is a good way just to get automatically disqualified Awesome question. Career break, acceptable, um, and, and just be transparent and explain it. You know, in your resume, you can literally, you can just I career, uh, stepped away and and just put the dates that they stepped away. Uh, and you know, typically you'll be asked about it, 
Um, nobody, I, I've never been intrusive in those conversations. I've never heard other recruiters be intrusive on those conversations. But, you know, the, the, normally it's like I, I see you stepped away from, uh, you know, 2006 to 2016. Uh, you know, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to share with me, but w was that just a career break or, or, and people normally will overshare, but uh, it's not, it, definitely now it's not frowned upon. You know, that just kind of goes back to being organized. Just be ready to explain, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to step away. I wanted to spend time with a family member. Um, I, I, I didn't feel safe. I, I didn't feel comfortable in my current position because uh, they're, uh, handling of the pandemic. Uh, so I decided that it was a good time to spend time with family or go back and get an, uh, further my education or get a certification. All that stuff is, is relatively fine. Years ago, I can't stress that enough. Um, just like I said, make sure that you, you can at least, and you don't have to divulge too much information, just make sure that you have the ability to, to explain that I stepped away, it was to take care of family, and now I'm, I'm recharged, I'm re-energized, and I want to get back to doing what I was doing before. Are these agencies the same as your typical temp agencies? So um, there are there are temporary agencies out there. Um, I would obviously, you know, a tech systems or an aerotech would they do do temporary contracts, but they they have a different build out and they have a di different type of clientele. So what you start seeing with uh, like those bigger um, agency companies or, or employment agencies is that they have a, a large client list, so they work with a diverse clientele. Their contra they have very, very specific contracts. The contracts, you know, will range anywhere from three months to two years, and they'll have contract to higher positions, and they normally pay uh, a good wage. Great questions. Undisclosed companies. So sometimes some companies don't want uh, don't want to be advertised. So they'll have some sort of agreement with the uh, recruiting companies saying that it's an, that they want to be listed as undisclosed. Um, so when you're working with these agencies, a really good way to tell if it's a scam or an, uh, a scam agency is literally just by googling the company. Um, it sounds really funny, but you know, if you Google Cognizant or Infosys or Aerotech or Tech Systems, you're going to get to, you're going to fall to a legitimate company website with a directory, all of that. You know, if it's a if it's a scam company, the webs they, they they just won't have a website or they won't have a phone number for you to call. Um, they won't have a location here in the United States. So I mean, that's that's an easy way to see it, but. Some some companies, you know, I know it sounds crazy. They uh, they will say that they want they they don't want their company to be disclosed that they're looking for a contract worker until an initial phone conversation takes place. Um, a really good example of that actually is Facebook. So I've been reached out to multiple times by agency recruiters trying to get me to go work at Facebook. And in their messaging, they'll be hinting at the company, you know, a large social media company that's based out of Palo Alto. Um, they have an office here in Chicago. They're looking for uh, people who are willing to work 12 month contracts. So they'll hint at it, but they won't come out and say it's Facebook until I get on the phone with them. Um, so that's a, that's an easy way to, uh, to tell that. Um, any other questions around that that side of agency? Cool. Well, we have five minutes left. Um, this, I, I apologize for for rambling. I, I will be the first to admit I was a little bit nervous doing this. That uh, it's one of the first times I've I've done a webinar. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything like that? Okay, I'm not. I'm not I'm not, I'm not. All 
Sorry, I was getting some feedback. Well, if there's no other questions, there's a uh, thank yous, great job, good info. Are you hearing my feedback? No. Okay, so Dan, I'm gonna thank you, thank you so much for your tips and strategies you shared today. Um, a few things, you know, that were good to hear for me was to, you know, list your accomplishments, be specific, to craft your resume um, based on desired outcomes of the job description. Um, research the company. I will. I literally, for my job searches, have spent probably the most time in this area. So that's really, really important. Um, to be transparent and embrace your, the candor, um, just be real. And I also like the STAR method to tell a meaningful story about your, your life and your successes and how you've brought value to companies. So I wanna say thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, I hope you all gained valuable knowledge today that can help you with your job search currently or in the future. Um, the webinar has been recorded, so it will be shared on our Lifelong Laker blog, which is a repository of all of our continuing education series. And our August webinars will be announced this week, so stay tuned for that. And we hope to see you at some more of our upcoming events. I did um, link our Facebook and LinkedIn pages for the alumni groups uh, in the chat. Dan put his LinkedIn, so feel free to reach out to him um, further uh, beyond this. And um, I hope everybody has a great week and stays healthy and safe. So take care, everybody.